Yes. Yes. Lovely. Uh, um, that's why. Yeah, of course. I just think I'm not a tech savvy. Yeah, so it's fine. <laughs> I can click. Happy with that. <laughs> Okay, Claire, can you go to the next slide and I'll start? Yes. We're just sorting out some microphones in here. Just give us one minute. And our numbers are still going up. So we've still got people joining. Can you know now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
which I'm sure looking at symptoms and managing them will be very well received by the patients. Well, thank you very much, Nona, and um, very glad to be joining everyone from a very hot room at Guy's Hospital London. So um, we are not sitting here with masks on because we're all facing outwards, but um, just in case you're wondering about announcements about NHS and face masks, but I would like to echo huge thanks to Claire Woodley, who has organised this session, as well as Rachel George and Lauren Unwin, who have um, agreed to join us here today. I'm sorry, Lauren Irwin. Um, here we go. You can see all of us here sitting together, facing a camera looking quite hot. I might have to run out and get everyone an ice cream in a minute. <laughs> Um, so we're going to focus today mainly on symptoms. I'm really super happy to have this team with us today because they have, Claire has got lots of experience looking after patients, but Lauren and Rachel have also been running a service looking at fatigue for our patients and have got lots of top tips for you and I'm really looking forward to um, hearing what they have to say. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Claire Woodley. Thanks to all of you who have submitted questions. You can send questions in in the chat and we will do our best to answer them. Um, and if we don't answer them at the time, we will answer them afterwards. Thanks very much and over to you, Claire. Thank you. Danny, you might need to help us with a presentation here. If you could just there. move on a couple of slides. Okay. These are all known as slides that I didn't quite get to. Here we go. There we go. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for um, what is would normally be our Guys and St Thomas's patient support group. Um, so it, it's nice to have many of you with us this evening. So I'm going to just cover very briefly MPN symptoms and measurements before we move forward with a focus on fatigue. So what do we know about MPMs? Well, we know that they are associated with a substantial disease burden and with symptoms that can impact on patients' quality of life. Although it's not unusual for some patients to have periods where they might not experience any symptoms, and, and equally periods where symptoms may be more prevalent for them. Um, the symptoms can vary according to which condition and also to personal patients' um, circumstances. Some of the symptoms are, are on this slide here, which you can see, um, and they may include fatigue, pruritus, um, night sweats, some microvascular symptoms, splenomegaly, anxiety, worry, um, but I think it's also important to recognise the impact that the conditions have on the patients, but also on family, friends, work and social situations. So I wanted to draw your attention to two large studies that were performed that looked at patients' experiences of um, symptoms. The first one was the US MPN landmark survey, which was the first of its kind in a large observational study that evaluated the impacts of living with MPNs on overall health and productivity for patients. What it found was that there was a reduction in quality of life and um, work in productivity. But some of the studies show that actually symptoms can vary between countries. So to see how patients outside of the USA was affected, the international landmark study was completed. Now, some of you on this um, forum this evening may well have taken part in that survey. It was an online survey of patients and physicians in um, six countries, Australia, Canada, Germany, Japan, Italy, and the UK. A total of 699 patients took part in the survey, and you can see here the breakdown of the patients with different conditions that took part. As well as patients, 219 physicians were also um, surveyed. There were two parts to the survey. Physicians completed a survey of 49 questions and patients completed a survey of 63 questions. It was an online survey that took approximately 25 to 30 minutes. It covered six main areas. 
that were included the relationship between the physician and the patient, attitudes towards disease and treatment, treatment and drug use, and the burden of the disease, as well as some of the characteristics of the disease and the demographics of the patients. Results of the survey were then kind of grouped together and covered um, different areas. So they covered the NPM and its symptoms, the physical impact, the emotional impact, the impact that it has on employment for patients and the patient experience. So what we'll look at is we'll look at the symptoms and the study showed us that most patients, oh, we've gone too far, sorry. The study showed us that most patients had experienced symptoms over the previous 12 months. In general, women reported um, overall higher levels of symptom burden, and the majority of patients had experienced a reduction in their quality of life, um, which this wasn't only related to kind of their symptoms, because even patients that perhaps didn't have quite a high um, symptom burden also experienced some reduction in their quality of life. I don't know whether you can see because the graph's quite small, but if you have a look at the graph, it shows um, the top 10 symptoms that patients reported over the previous 12 months. And it's split out into the different diseases. So we've got MF, uh, sorry, ET in the lighter pink, slightly darker is PV, and then the darkest color is MF patients. Um, what you can see is that the most commonly reported symptom across all of the different subtypes of conditions was fatigue. It was experienced by more women than men, and although more prevalent in patients with high risk disease, a good proportion of patients with low risk disease also experienced fatigue. Um, and this is something that we do see a lot in our clinics. Um, we can find that patients, irrespective of their control of their blood counts, can still experience symptoms and fatigue. It was also a symptom that the study highlighted that patients most wanted to see an improvement in. Um, now, some of the other symptoms that are also mentioned here include abdominal discomfort, shortness of breath, night sweats, problems with sleeping, bruising, weakness, um, pruritus, dizziness, loss of concentration, some numbness and tingling in hands and feet, headaches and visual changes. We're just going to have a look at just a couple of the symptoms, because unfortunately tonight we don't um, have the time to go through all of the symptoms, but I thought I'd pick out two that I most frequently get asked about in clinic. So the first one is fatigue, um, and I just, fatigue is very much how the individual feels that it is. So I thought what I would show you is just a couple of quotes from patients about how they find or how they try to describe their fatigue. Um, so people just don't get how shattered you feel because you look fine on the outside, or it's a bit more than just being tired, like all your energy has been zapped out of you. Reserves are on red and you just can't do anything. Um, and another one, some days it feels like I'm wearing a spacesuit and being made to walk underwater. Even the simplest task is an uphill struggle. Patients also say to me, it, it's kind of one minute you're fine and then the next minute this fatigue is overwhelming. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm oh, there we go. Um, so what do we know about fatigue? It's complex. There are different levels of fatigue. It impacts on pretty much most of patients' life. So on their daily activities, it can impact on mobility, on general functioning, work, family relationships, interactions with other people. It can affect your mood, emotions, concentration, and, and many more. And you will hear more about this when Lauren and Rachel do speak. What causes fatigue? Well, it can be very multifactorial. So we know that sometimes medication can make fatigue worse. Your blood counts might affect your fatigue. Sometimes the um, cytokine release can also affect fatigue. Nutrition, psychological distress, pain, exercise, lifestyle, and sleep. So what do we sometimes suggest to patients to do with trying to help manage their fatigue? So we, I do ask my patients that are reporting it to monitor their symptoms. What is the pattern of the fatigue? Is there a particular time in the day that they find things worse? Because sometimes that can help when we're looking at how we can tailor activities or how they're feeling. 
you will hear a lot more from our OTM physio next to me because they provide our patients with a superb service that helps them to recognize fatigue, helps them to understand fatigue and what they can do from it. And I certainly have a lot of feedback from our patients that have used this service with how beneficial it has been for them and how much they have gained from being in with the physios and OTs. And this is something that they remember because you know if their fatigue improves um, and then unfortunately they get a return of their fatigue, they're still using these techniques that they have learned many years down the line. Um, it's important to find out what's important to you. What are your goals? What is it that you want to be achieving? Because then again, that helps us to look at how we might manage the fatigue. Um, it's about balance, remembering, you know, quite often when we feel good, we think, right, this is the day I'm going to do everything because I feel good. However, the next day, then we're completely wiped out because we've used all of our energy in that one day. So it's important about remembering to, yes, we might use a lot of energy, but how do we also get the energy back again? Um, sometimes it's about looking at how we plan, prioritize and pace our activities during the day. It might be simple things such as adaptations to our environment. Maybe we need a chair when we're cooking. Um, to remember about relaxation, um, some skills such as mindfulness, meditation, massage can sometimes help with improving fatigue. Um, and also importantly, a good sleep routine. Um, and, and sometimes that's about making sure that, you know, you reduce the light in a room, you avoid going on the electrics before bedtime so that you can unwind. Um, and also the importance of diet and hydration. Now I've whizzed over those because I'm quite conscious that Lauren and Rachel will pick up on some of these things a bit later. The other one I thought I'd mention as well is pruritus. So what's pruritus? That horrible itch that you can't do anything with. That itch that comes on perhaps after showering that you just want to scratch vigorously and for some patients it's about you know they've made themselves bleed where they've been itching so much this is how a couple of patients have described the itch so an itch makes it sound simple it feels like a thousand ants crawling under your skin prodding you with hot pokers on a really bad day adding a blowtorch being used as well nothing makes it go away after a quick shower it will start in an area and spread like wildfire nothing makes it go away I sometimes use a wire brush until my skin bleeds. So this is important as it, it highlights how much more it is than an itch that will just simply go on scratching. So there are a number of things that can be done to help try and manage itching. So th this slide shows some of the things such as antihistamine, looking at what triggers your itch, what might be changed for it, you know, how you deal with it after a shower. Sometimes patients like hot water, sometimes patients like cold water, patting yourself dry instead of rubbing with a towel, putting, using cream that's been in the fridge so it's really cool. I think what's the important thing for me in looking at this symptom and in looking at our other symptom is the importance of talking to your clinical team about the symptoms that you're experiencing because we will have we will be able to discuss it with you, suggest ways of managing it. And sometimes these are tips that, you know, we collect from patients when they're in the clinic. I'm often told by a patient, oh, this is what I do. And I might mention it to another patient of a tip that might help with managing their symptoms. So I can't stress enough how important it is that, you know, if you are experiencing symptoms is to discuss it with your clinical team. What I wanted to show you with this slide is some of the other um, ways in which the study also found that symptoms can impact on patients. So if we look at finances and work and colleague, the report shows that patients did report an impact on their work. The higher the symptom burden seemed to have a greater negative effect on patients working. And a lot of patients reported decreasing their working hours or taking early or voluntary retirement. And I suppose as, as a nurse specialist or a, a nurse practitioner in the clinic, what can we do to help you with these types of conversations is, you know, we're, or I'm certainly in my practice, happy to liaise with work, work teams in order to provide you with the information to discuss with your work 
colleagues about kind of what an MPN is, how the symptoms might affect you, but also to um, empower patients to say, well, these are the questions we need to be asking. This is what I need to be looking at. What can we do to try and help ourselves in the working environment? We also, the study also looked at the emotional impact. Um, so concerns such as worry, worry about kind of what my blood counts, will my condition remain the same? Will it get any worse? A lot of patients were anxious and, and some patients reported uh, a decrease in their mood and depression as well. Um, and again, this is something that you can discuss with your clinical team. You know, there are other support services that we can access that can help with managing some of the emotional impact of an MPN and its symptoms. The study also looked at kind of uh, relationships and how MPN and symptoms can impact on relationships and interactions with family and friends. And again, some of the things that we do as nurses that can help with this is equipping, is equipping the patients with kind of ways and means of discussing what an MPN is and how it might affect you and how symptoms might change from hour to hour and day to day to enable you to be able to discuss these with family and friends. So tracking symptoms. So as I've mentioned, I personally think it's very important that patients are aware of their symptoms and aware of how you can monitor your symptoms in order to equip you when you come into your clinic appointments, because sometimes you come in, the main thing is what are my blood's doing? And then everything else goes out the window once you've had your blood results, because often or not, you might then feel relaxed and go, okay, that's fine. I can move on now. Um, so I think Symptom tracking is very important in you being able to monitor how your symptoms are over time, not just at your clinic consults, but sometimes in between your appointments. And it, it equips you when you come into the um, appointments that you might think, well, actually, this is my problem symptom at the moment. And this is what I most want to discuss with my team today. So one of the ways of um, monitoring your symptoms is through the MPN 10 symptom assessment tool. It's a validated tool that's been used in a lot of research studies, and it covers the 10 most relevant symptoms that we know patients can experience. And these are symptoms that we've mentioned earlier. So it talks about fatigue, early satiety, abdominal discomfort, inactivity, um, problems with concentration, night sweats, itching, um, bone pain, fever, and unintentional weight loss. It's scored on a scale of zero to 10, zero meaning you don't have the symptom, 10 meaning that it's the worst imaginable for you. Now, sometimes patients will say, well, how can I give it a score? How can I rate it from zero to 10? And I think for me, it's important that the score is very individualized to you. I can't tell you what a five looks like. It's very much how you would rate your symptom at that time. And what is then is important for us is to see how that symptom changes over time. If you start a treatment, does that symptom get better? Does it get worse if you're not on the symptom? Or are there periods where fatigue might be a six and then suddenly it's a 10? And for me in clinic and when I'm seeing patients, that then says to me, well, something's changed and what's happening for that symptom for you? What do we need to discuss? What do we need to look at that might then help us to make that symptom better for you? Now, this, um, this is a paper version that you can see here, but it's also available online. Um, this is the website for it. And basically it's run by, although it's run by Novartis, they can't actually access any of your data that you put into this um, tool. You click on which disease group you're under, and then it comes up and you can change it to which language you want to do it in. And then it covers the 10 um, symptoms. And you just move, as you can see in the bottom, you move the scale along as to which number it is for you. You can then save it, you can email it to your clinical team, or you can bring it with you when you come into a consult. And, and then that allows us to see what's happening for symptoms for you, especially in between clinics when things might change or you know some patients have long periods between their clinics so might want to monitor their symptoms in between. 
So what are the benefits for, for you if you complete the symptom assessments? Well, it tells me what symptoms you are experiencing. It also guides you on what symptoms you may experience and, and what we might associate with your underlying MPN. It tells you how symptoms are affecting you and your lifestyle. Are symptoms changing? As I said before, it can help you in conversations with the healthcare team. So, you know, it might guide you to discuss a particular symptom. It can tell us how symptoms respond over time. Are they responding to treatment? Might we need to consider changing your treatment if symptoms aren't responding? But also it enables you to have an active role in managing your care and accessing any additional support services that might be available to you. I put this in just to say, that symptom assessment tool only covers those 10 symptoms. And we've already discussed earlier how there may be other symptoms that you might be experiencing. I don't think it really matters how you monitor your symptoms. The MPN 10 score is a really good numerical tool for us. But equally, if you find it easier monitoring your symptoms in a diary, keeping a track on your phone, all of those things are very va valuable and it actually enables us as the clinical team to say, well, okay, this is what's happening for you. So I think, you know, if, if you find it easier to keep a diary, then that, that's, that's good enough to do and to then be able to track your symptoms over the time. Um, so what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to hand over to Lauren and Rachel, who will thank you very much for coming to talk to us and focusing on fatigue now. Thank you, Claire, that's great. Now I need to work out how to use the clicky device. Ah. <laughs> um, hi everyone, thanks again for being here. Uh, Rachel and I are gonna talk a bit more about fatigue. Uh, just initially, what we're gonna aim to try and cover um, in our session is just thinking about what fatigue is and what causes it um, and us understanding that, thinking about how it affects you uh, and what you can do about it uh, and how you might describe it, uh, some of the key things we're going to aim to cover. Um, so what is fatigue? I, I've got a definition here. So persistent subjective feeling of tiredness weakness or lack of energy, physical and or mental, related to a cancer or an advanced chronic illness. So that's an example of a sort of dictionary-ish definition, um, one of the formal definitions, but is it yours? And I think that's one of the important questions to start with. Um, and that definition of fatigue is gonna be completely different from person to person because one person's fatigue is gonna be completely different to the next person's fatigue, uh, how it works and looks and feels will be completely different. Uh, we know that a really high percentage of people experience this symptom, 80%, probably more. Um, we don't know exactly what's causing the fatigue. We think likely multifactorial to do with the, the, the process in the body and the treatments people have as well. Uh, is often described as excessive tiredness or exhaustion uh, that's persistent uh, and not proportional to your recent levels of activity, often not relieved by sleep or rest, can often feel unpredictable uh, and can affect you physically, uh, mentally or, or sort of emotionally, so various different domains. We also know that there's a difference between fatigue and tiredness. Tiredness is a very normal thing. I'm sure we've probably all experienced it at one stage or another, caused by overactivity, a long day, a late night, uh, usually resolved by sleep or rest of some description. We find that fatigue doesn't work like that. Uh, and often it's characterized by feeling very disproportionate to the amount of activity that you've done. Um, so you're feeling much more tired than we would reasonably expect based on what, what you've done activity wise and isn't necessarily resolved by, by sleep or rest. And that when we're talking about the difference between a, a fatigue uh, and a tiredness, that's the kind of thing we're thinking about. And it's really helpful to be able to differentiate between the two uh, and talk about that with people. Um, 
So thinking about the bits I've just covered and some of the bits that, that Claire previously mentioned, if I asked you right now to describe your fatigue to me and tell me what your fatigue is, would you be able to do that? And possibly more importantly, if a, a friend or family member or somebody at work asked you to, to describe and explain your fatigue, would you be able to? One really powerful way of gaining more control over this symptom is, is understanding it and being able to put it into words. We know that it can be a really hidden symptom uh, and people don't always understand particularly well. Um, so being able to explain it in a really clear way that makes sense for you um, can really help other people understand. And often we find that if other people have a, a better understanding, that can be really helpful in terms of supporting your management of the symptom. So I, I guess a, a question at this stage is, are you able to explain your fatigue in an effective way? that makes sense to you, to other people. Uh, and if you're not, is it worth having a, a think about that and a think about what, what you might say? And I know that I, I talk, we talk a lot about this if we're delivering, delivering training, um, often sort of to, to staff members, one of the questions we you know, will ask is, is how you describe fatigue and, and have a think about putting a bit of a short paragraph together that talks about it in a way that makes sense to you and you can explain to somebody else. So another question that might be worth having a think about is how your, your fatigue affects you. Perhaps not, maybe not the easiest question to answer and completely different from person to person. Um, some of the questions that might be helpful to think about in answering this question are things like, how does the fatigue make you feel? Have you noticed any patterns? Have you noticed anything that makes it worse? Have you noticed anything that makes it better? Are there any other compounding factors? So things that you've noticed impact your fatigue. So things like sleep, does that particularly impact for you? Diet, does that particularly impact for you? Mood, is that a big impact for you? Um, do you notice if your fatigue fits more into one domain or another? So for example, is it, is it a fatigue that's worsened more by physical things? Is it something that's impact more on by a, a more cognitive tasks? Is it a combination of things? How is it impacting your day? And, and what is it stopping you doing that you would like to be able to do? Claire has mentioned sort of about tracking symptoms and that is something that we do a lot with people and talk about a lot and use things like fatigue diaries to think a bit more about tracking the symptom of fatigue and, and looking a bit more in depth at people's individual fatigue and, and how it's working and that can be really really helpful so i guess a really big question that we always like to ask is what's important to you and I think it's it's a particularly helpful question when we're thinking about fatigue management and there's no right or wrong answer but having an idea about what your priorities are and what's important to you is really going to help when we're thinking about what strategies might support the management of, of this symptom. So we know that this is a really complex symptom um, and that it can impact lots of different areas of people's lives. Uh, some examples of that here are things like uh, relationships. It can often impact relationships, things like people think I'm being lazy if I can't do things, the things that we hear a lot. Self-care, simply being able to wash and, and dress. Um, having no energy to sort of bath or shower, those sorts of things come up quite a lot. Not being able to do things around the house, impacting sort of roles, um, often something that people talk about being impacted. What we see is that fatigue can often cause a, a reduction in participation in daily activities, and that sometimes reduces people's purpose and, and meaning and 
general enjoyment and quality of life and, and that becomes a really big problem um, and people report things like difficulties with sort of the smallest chores feeling like they've got no energy or strength having difficulty concentrating and remembering um, things that comes up a lot um, shortness of breath also something else that we find is really interlinked with fatigue um, difficulty making decisions uh, and frustration around this So we're going to start to talk about what, what we can do about it. Um, I think that the key thing and a really good starting place, you know, is getting to know your fatigue uh, and thinking about how you talk about your fatigue, how you describe it, really understanding it yourself is a really solid foundation to start with in thinking about how to manage your fatigue, getting to know it um, and, and trying to work with it. It, it may be that there's, there's nothing we can do to take it away completely, but it doesn't need to control you. Uh, and there are things that you can do that can make life easier um, living with it. Uh, so understanding the, the factors that contribute to it and, and your individual experience can be a really, really key starting point to thinking about what you can do about fatigue. And then thinking about opening this, this idea of opening a toolbox um, and having a, a range of strategies that work for you, that you can use at different times in different places to help manage your energy in the most effective way. And that might be things like um, planning, prioritizing and pacing activities, changing behaviors and challenging some thinking traps. Uh, adapting environments or use use of sort of bits of adaptive equipment, finding ways to conserve energy for things that are, are more meaningful and most important, um, improving recovery and relaxation time. And that's sort of from a both mental and physical perspective. Um, and, and building confidence in knowing what what's meaningful rest for you and, and what's actually effective rest for you. Um, thinking about improved sleep improved diet you know, and exercise, um, another big one, graded activity plans. Uh, I think we will talk a, a, bit, a bit more in depth about, about these as we go on. So opening the toolbox, one of the most important things around getting control of your fatigue is to think about balance. So we need to be aware of supply and demand uh, and how we look at improving this. Um, so it, I, a way that really helps me think about it is it's like a bank account. So if you take money, it's difficult to take money out of your bank account um, if you haven't put it in. I'm sure we're all aware of that. Uh, and if you do go into your overdraft, uh, that's something that then is really difficult and takes longer to get out of. And that's the same concept as this idea of balance of supply and demand. So in order to take energy out of your energy bank, you need to put energy in. And thinking about what that looks like for you can be really beneficial. So what puts energy into the energy bank for you? And that, again, is going to vary and differ from person to person. Um, you know, is it food that gives you an energy boost? Is it exercise? You know, is it effective rest? And then on the flip side, thinking about what is costly and what takes energy out of the bank for you. And is that exercise is that household tasks is that work and having an understanding of of what what your supply and demand looks like is really key to the to the management effective management of energy um, as i said being mindful of how much each activity costs is really helpful um, and then the toolbox hopefully aims to help you use energy in the most efficient way and ensure that the best level of energy possible is available. Some more things to think about in the toolbox might be planning ahead, might be organising an environment for the best way for you, might be thinking about posture and adopting good postures, um, prioritising activities, thinking about rest breaks and frequent rest breaks and when they might be, thinking about other healthy lifestyle factors. What we find is that the key to fatigue management is the person. Um, and it, I think it can be really difficult um, 
thinking about fatigue management because often it means changing things behavior change and and adapting and that can be really difficult and sometimes at odds to how people have been used to living before uh, and sometimes I've had sort of people say to me things like you know I feel like I'm losing control of some aspects of my life um, and benefits of using management strategies aren't necessarily always instantly um, identifiable it's not always immediate the 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 impact which can can be difficult and frustrating as well and I think that having conversations with family and friends and people understanding can also be be really difficult and, and we've talked about it being a bit of a, a hidden symptom but getting the right balance allows people to um, to make the most of the energy that they do have but it takes patience and perseverance and occasional setbacks but hopefully the end result would be leading to a, a more fulfilling life which is you know very much what we're, we're aiming for. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Rachel who's just going to talk a bit in a bit more detail about a few of the strategies. Thank you, Lauren. So um, I'm first just going to touch on in terms of a, a, a kind of a concept, really, that we advise patients to use. So it's um, termed the five P's. And as you can see, it's planning, prioritising, pacing. It's around um, posture and also giving yourself permissions like, and being kind to yourself. So it's really important that we think about how or you think about how your fatigue fluctuates during the day and the week. And this can help you then plan to do the things that are really important to you. Um, so using these, this concept, this is an example of it will basically get you um, thinking about the things that you have to do, the things that are important to you, and those things that aren't necessarily as important, or when are there good times in your day or bad times in your day, or even your week. So actually, sometimes we advise that it's actually really important that patients do keep a fatigue diary so they can actually, because sometimes you don't know unless you actually can see it written down or you're actually communicating it with someone. So actually, we find um, it really helpful for patients to actually keep a log and actually writing things down because actually they're then having an awareness about things that they didn't necessarily realise was a problem. And um, by keeping a log of how you're feeling first thing in the morning, for example, or at lunchtime or evening when you're napping and um, how you feel when you wake up from your naps or sleep because then that will help guide your clinicians about also the severity of of the fatigue um so as i said already it's helpful to use when planning and it also can help you communicate to your medical team around actually what this symptom means for you and, and how debilitating it is and that includes your gp or other clinicians from the hospital setting so in terms of as part of the planning um, aspect, you need to think about distributing heavy tasks throughout the week, so not focusing them on every single day. You need to make sure that you're analysing the tasks that you're actually wanting to perform. So it can be broken down, for example, into smaller tasks. Um, so you can plan in rest breaks and so you can split up heavy tasks and light duty. So you're not doing all those heavy things all at once. For example, um, patients you know, really want to have a shower. They want to make their bed. They want to cook their meals and they want to do it all in the morning as part of their morning routine. However, actually, by the end of that, they're absolutely exhausted and then they can't do any activities for the rest of the day. So this um, thought process and you actually taking some time to actually um, document how your fatigue is impacting you will actually make sure that you're conserving some of your energy throughout the day so you're not using it all up first thing in the morning and then completely exhausted and then not able to do things that are meaningful or important to you. You also need to think about planning your week around your treatments. If you're on active treatment, you need to think about actually on particular weeks, do you then need to take a step back from certain activities because you're actively having treatment? And also you need to think about if you have a fever or your um, blood count is low, your body will, go, will naturally be using more energy during this time. So you actually need to be kind to yourself and give yourself more rest um, if this um, occurs. Um, and some of you will find that you're unable to do all of the things that you used to be able to do. Um, so it may be necessary to really think about the things that are really important to you. Um, so you're able to do some of those things yourself or you're able to delegate them to somebody else or actually just actually stop doing them all together. Um, in terms of the prioritization, so you need to think how important is this job? Is it essential? Can someone else do it? And does it need to be done today? 
and also aim to complete the things that are most important and satisfying to you. That's the key thing when we're getting you to think about the things that are important to you and planning your days, weeks, months is actually still being able to do the things that are really meaningful and important to you. So how can we then help put this into kind of action? So this is where pacing comes into play. And there are lots of things that we can look at in order to help with pacing activities and to help actually increase your tolerance to activities and to reduce that feeling of fatigue um, or lack of energy. So the first thing that you need to think about is time. So think about how long the activity usually takes for you to finish it. And um, it's be very mindful here that the longer you do one thing, the more energy you actually use. So can it be broken up into smaller chunks? Can it actually be done in a different way to reduce the time and um, to make it easier to control when you're looking at um, these pacing strategies? And maybe think about actually start, starting off by planning to do an activity for about 10 minutes, and then you can slowly increase the time at controlled intervals with help from clini um, clinical professionals. The other thing you need to think about in terms of when you're pacing activities is thinking about the distance. Um, so this is good for particularly for activities that obviously involve motion. And sometimes it's difficult to think of walking only a part way of a destination because everyone wants to be able to get there and back. But actually, as part of this pacing and planning strategy to help manage your fatigue, it can actually um, be really important step to actually think about. Um, just walking one way, for example, to a hospital appointment, to the bus stop, rather than actually trying to do both ways. And actually, these small stepping stones can actually help you gradually build up your energy levels and your tolerance to, to doing exercise. The next thing you need to consider is about the speed at which you're doing any activities. So the faster you do an activity, the more energy you're going to use. And when we are used to doing things quickly, this can actually be really difficult, um, and but actually can make a really big difference. So actually slowing down the pace at which you're trying to do some certain activities. The next factor is to think about the strength. So there are a number of reasons why you may have lost um, muscular strength since your diagnosis or since you commenced treatment. So medications such as steroids can impact on your muscle bulk and um, your muscle size. And obviously, periods of inactivity decrease um, muscle bulk and strength. And also, if you're exercising left, that obviously has a um, negative impact on generally making you feel weaker. So you need to consider these things when you're trying to do activities. So trying to still do things such as, for example, the shopping. So you're actually still trying to keep active as, as much as possible. And then you can then this will help gradually try and build up your strength. Equally, talking about being active and um, enhancing your exercise tolerance or um, ability to actually just carry out tasks while actually being able to concentrate, you need to really think about rest. So this is key. And um, so for some people, rest means different things. Um, and it does actually mean letting yourself relax completely and actually letting your body fully recharge. So sitting, watching the TV is not rest as it still involves mental energy and you're still having to, to think during that activity. So you can use certain relaxation techniques that we're going to talk about a little bit later on in the presentation um, to actually really switch off your body and your mind. Because actually, if you're still having to cognitively think about something, even if you think watching mindless TV is actually relaxing, but actually you're still cognitively using energy. And the other thing you need to think about is the complexity of the tasks that you're trying to do. Um, so this most relates to any mental tasks that you're thinking about doing. And you can reduce how complex a task is by reducing like background noise, for example, or focusing on just one thing at a time. So the next slide um, we're going to talk about is um, actually life in a jar. So this, there's a concept here that um, this jar represents your life. So the stones in the jar are the most important things in, in your life. So your family, your health, your friends, and the things that you feel really passionate about. If everything in this jar was lost and they own, and if everything else was lost and only they remained, your life would still be full. The gravel chips are the other things that matter, like your job, your house, and your car. The sand is everything else, so the small stuff. If you put sand into the jar first, there is no room for the gravel or the stones. And the same goes for life. If you spend all your time and energy on the small stuff, you will never have room for the things that are most important to you. So we need to take care of the stones first, the things that really matter, and then the rest is just sand. The sand can polish the stones, but it's not essential. 
So this is just a, an interesting concept to think about actually, but using an analogy like this to think about actually what is really meaningful, what is important, and actually try not to sweat the small stuff, um, but actually think about the things that are really important. Um, we're now going to move on to, um, again, a little bit more around opening the toolbox that Lauren talked about earlier. So touching on the environment again. So we need to make sure that we're storing things um, in appropriate places. So things that we use regularly, for example, in um, the kitchen or in your bathroom or even in your wardrobe, you need to make sure that you can easily reach these. So you're setting up your environment to actually conserve your energy. So you're not having to reach up for things, stretching, because actually that does actually take up a lot of energy. So you need to think about your environment at home and setting that up so actually you've got things all within easy reach. You need to make sure that you've got good lighting and ventilation. And we can use adaptive equipment also to help with certain tasks or to make the environment a better place for you to be able to manage certain things. So um, having a perch stool, having grab rails, having long handed um, grab rails as well um, can help aid like getting um, dressed, get, putting your shoes and socks on. Um, and um, you can also within the kitchen, for example, use labour saving devices such as um, food processors or microwaves to actually conserve some energy. In terms of um, just touching upon relaxation again, so it is really important, as I said earlier, you need to be kind to yourself and you need to take time for yourself. It's also really important if you feel comfortable and able to, able to, sorry, to talk about um, your worries and concerns with others. So not to keep those things inside because actually sharing um, your concerns and worries can actually help alleviate and solve potentially some of the concerns that you may have if you share and communicate that with others. You can also try as part of a relaxation technique, you can try a distraction um, method such as listening to music and um, taking yourself through some progressive relaxation or actually myself or Lauren as physios and OTs will take patients through progressive muscular relaxation as well. And these are the relaxation um, tools that I was referring to earlier. And you also need to start to become aware of any muscle tension. Muscle tension is not good. It creates stress and it, we need to help try and relieve the body as much as possible of that. Um, and um, relaxation techniques are obviously activities that generate a feeling hopefully of complete peace and um, take you away from the daily hustle and bustle and potentially the stresses and concerns and worries that you're um, experiencing. Relaxation is also um, imperative to help with your fatigue as it actually promotes good sleep patterns and um, you get increased benefit from actually the rest periods that you do give yourself um, during the day and these can also be useful to actually help manage stressful situations. Um, relaxation um, techniques also make sure that you actually get a deeper level of rest and relaxation rather than um, maybe as if you were just watching TV, for example, actually going through some techniques such as progressive muscular relaxation means that you actually rest in a much deeper and physiological and um, cellular level as well. You can also use techniques such as deep breathing or um, certain um, breathing techniques, um, which can be also taken from things such as yoga. Um, so you can use some kind of yoga inspired breathing techniques to actually also get you to that deeper relaxation feeling. And also there's the benefit of using some visualization tools as well. Um, in terms of the other um, relaxation methods, you can use aromatherapy. So complementary therapy is also great for this. So you can have massage, um, reflexology, Reiki, all of those kind of things will also um, help be helpful. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, things such as yoga, Tai Chi or Pilates are also things um, that would be good for you to undertake. Or And I think some people are very reluctant to take on things like yoga because they believe they have to be really physically fit. They're getting into all sorts of weird and wonderful positions, but actually yoga can be done in a chair. You don't need to be you know, doing headstands or things like that. It can actually be really quite basic, but actually be really powerful in terms of actually what it does to the mind and the body. Um, in terms of sleep, so it's really important that you get into a routine. So a lot of us, um, don't necessarily have good routines of sleep. We, we go to sleep at different times in the day or nighttime. We wake up at different times. And actually, we need to try and make sure that you get into as um, good routine as possible. So going to bed, ideally at the same time every night and waking in the same time in the mornings. 
you need to make sure that you're not exercising too close to bedtime because that actually gives you endorphins and actually wakes you up and is actually stimulating you rather than actually getting you ready for sleep. Um, you need to make sure that the environment that you're sleeping in is a good temperature and um, you're limiting the amount of noise and you, you're avoiding stimulants again two hours before you go to sleep. So things such as caffeine, alcohol, um, light stimulation, so blue light from your mobile phones or iPads or laptops. Again, all of that should be avoided two hours before um, you're planning on going to sleep. Um, the thing is sleep can sometimes, obviously the importance is knowing how you feel when you wake up from when you've had a sleep or a nap, because if you don't feel rested, then you've potentially got some cancer related fatigue. So it's really important for you to know when you do have a nap, do you feel rested from it? Was it actually helpful? Or from your um, prolonged period of sleep at night time, how do you feel after that? Do you feel rested? Do you actually still feel tired? Because then this is where you potentially need to use some of these strategies that myself and Lauren have mentioned, or get yourself referred to an OT or physio to actually help you. Um, it's sometimes good to make sure that you have maybe a worry book next to your bedside or um, where you tend to sleep. So then if there's certain things that are worrying you before you go to sleep, you can write them down. And sometimes that's really helpful in terms of um, reducing stress before sleep and actually can help get you make sure that you get a deeper sleep. Um, the other key um, thought process is that you make sure that you actually sleep in your bedroom. So you don't not sleep on the sofa or um, a chair because actually that doesn't induce good quality sleep. So um, our advice would be that you do actually sleep in your bedroom or on a bed and not other um, like chairs or sofas because that doesn't induce good sleep. And actually then you're associating your bedroom with sleep and actually that then helps get back into that normal routine um, and a good sleep hygiene. Um, so the next um, slide is now we're going to talk about exercise. And I know, again, this is something that people, they get concerned about in terms of, oh God, exercise means going on a treadmill, going into the gym. Absolutely not. Exercise has many different forms and we can all do some kind of exercise or physical activity. It doesn't mean to say that we're running a mile every single day. It can be simply um, walking your dog a short distance, even doing a flight of stairs, um, gardening and household chores. So those are things at the bottom of this pyramid that we should try and to do those kind of activities every single day. Um, and then three to five times a week, we need to try and, if possible, undertake some kind of aerobic exercise or recreational activities. And two to three times a week, we should definitely try and incorporate or you should be trying to incorporate flexibility and strength training. And then we need to all try and cut down on our um, stimulation from TV, video games, mobile phone devices. So why are we talking about exercise or physical activity? So reduced physical activity levels can actually um, exacerbate your fatigue or your lack of energy. And scientists have also found that even healthy adults forced to spend extended periods in bed or sitting in chairs develop feelings of anxiety, depression, weakness, fatigue, and moderate exercise has been shown to help decrease all of these feelings and help a person feel more energetic and stay active. So why are we asking you to be active or do some kind of exercise? So this will help you maintain the things that are important to you in terms of your day-to-day -day tasks, and it will prevent that deconditioning that we were talking about earlier on in terms of losing muscular strength. And deconditioned muscles cause increased effort to get them to work. Therefore, more energy is therefore required to complete a task, which is why it's really important to try and maintain um, good strength. And exercise can be any activity, as I said, which involves energy and expenditure above your resting level. And this is around trial and error. So you need to find the right type of exercise or physical activity that's for you. This is very individualized. And this is something that as physios and OT, we would work very closely with you on to actually guide you as to what the most important, um, what the right type of exercise or physical activity is for you. This isn't to say that me and Lauren are gonna do the same things, um, even though our fatigue might be the same. Um, we, it actually needs to be really individualized to you. <coughs> Excuse me. So what is the right kind of exercise? So um, the right kind of exercise is a good exercise plan is one that starts slowly. And we need to make sure that you're allowing your body um, to adjust. You also need it to be the right kind of, the right kind of exercise is something that you're going to be able to do regularly. Um, so you're going to be able to do it every day or every other day, and we can slowly build it up. Um, but it makes you, and you need to actually, when you're carrying out any type of exercise or physical activity, you need to be able to feel that you've actually done something, but you're not completely burnt out, that you haven't emptied your tank. So this then um, goes on to what is the wrong kind of exercise? 
So doing no exercise or physical activity is the wrong kind of exercise. You need to be, or occasionally exercising again is wrong. You need to be getting into that habit of doing something daily. It doesn't need to be long bursts. You can slowly build that up, but you do need to be doing something every single day. Um, also the wrong type of exercise is doing too much because obviously if you're then say in one day doing lots of different activities then you're going to be completely burnt out um, and it's what we um, team or term sorry the boom bust cycle so on one day you do all these activities because you're feeling great and then the next day you literally have nothing left in your tank and you can't even do the basic of ADLs or um, activities of daily living so it's about trying to find that balance of doing something but not overdoing it so then the next days aren't compromised so you do need to plan some activity or light exercise into your day such as light walking some simple strengthening exercises which don't necessarily need to involve weights you can just be using your body weight or things such as sit to stands for example is a good enough physical activity because it's something that gets your heart rate a little bit up and actually is getting you to use some of your energy stores as well so here are some just examples of um, some physical activity or exercise. So as you can see, it can be walking, gardening. If you are able to, then obviously some more strenuous activities such as swimming, cycling, or as you can see from the picture at the bottom in the middle, it could just be seat a seated exercise class with some therabands, so some strengthening resistance bands to try and help improve your overall strength. Also things, as I mentioned earlier, seated yoga, it doesn't need to be necessarily hugely strenuous, but it's down to that individual because some people may be able to do more strenuous activities compared to others. So do not, in this scenario, compare yourself to others. So the um, obviously the guidance around um, exercise and people that have cancer is that we should still be um, working towards doing 150 minutes of exercise um, a week. Um, and you can break that down into um, smaller chunks um, or things that work for you. But that is the um, government guidelines um, for physical activity. And that's something that we can slowly progress and, and work towards. And this will then give you optimal benefit in terms of actually um, reaping the benefits to actually help with your fatigue and energy, but also actually maintaining your strength um, whilst doing a bit of resistance training or aerobic training. So the guidance generally, or the message is, doing a little something is better than doing nothing at all. Um, so um, the top tips now, so for example, we're going to talk about in terms of just balancing that rest and activity. So it is a balancing act, so you don't get that boom bust scenario that I mentioned earlier. So it's about actually um, keeping that fatigue diary. So you're logging on at certain times within your treatment cycles, for example, actually week three is my bad week. So therefore you're going to reduce your amount of activity um, and incorporate more rest into that week. Um, and then on the other weeks when actually you're feeling a bit better after your treatment cycle, then actually you can slowly start to increase what you're able to do. So it's about doing that graded exercise and activities. So it's about making exercise and physical activity a habit. And that is a difficult thing to do. It takes some time. It takes up to three months to actually make something a habit. But starting off slowly and not reaching towards the top of Everest, for example, um, actually then will help create it into part of your normal everyday um, activity. And you'll see a huge difference in terms of your fatigue and, and how that is making you feel on a day to day basis. So it's about going back to those the five P's. So making sure that you're planning, prioritizing and pacing on a day to day, weekly basis um, and finding the right level of ex exercise that's for you. So not comparing yourself to anyone else. Um, incorporating relaxation um, through some of the strategies that I talked about earlier. And you need to find something that you enjoy, because if you're trying to do something just for the sake of doing it, because someone's told you you need to do X, Y and Z, but you don't enjoy it, then you're never going to be compliant with it. You're not going to keep up with that. Um, so you need to find something that's enjoyable for you. Um, and you can speak to obviously um, other MDT professionals, so physios, OTs um, and other health professionals as well. So some of you are, are um attend a local gym or anything like that, you do need to make sure that you're getting trained professional help rather than um, untrained or unqualified um, advice when you're doing this.
Um, so in terms of what we actually offer here to our patients at Guy's Cancer Centre, so this may not be offered everywhere, but this is what certainly we as a physio and OT team offer at the Guy's Cancer Centre. So we do have a specialist rehab team that can assess patients on a one-to-one -one basis and, and support you with your symptoms that impact your physical function. So we can help with things such as appetite, walking, um, breathing, um, fatigue levels, obviously, um, helping to help you grade and um, increase your exercise um, tolerance we can help with pain assisting with sleep and also prevent you from um, giving you like prevention strategies to potentially help you stop you falling in the future for example as well so it's it's kind of like quite um, broad in terms of what ATs and physios can offer you but it's certainly something that as a specialist team that those services are out there and available to you and um, but you need to ask a member of your local health team because obviously every service off operates slightly differently but these are the things that therapy, the th therapy team can actually offer you. So in terms of referring to us here at Guy's, you can self-refer into the Guy's Cancer Centre. Obviously, if you're under Guy's SST like trust, um, or you can get your GP to refer you, but you can self-refer. And I think that's us done. Thank you. Well, that was absolutely great. Thank you very much. Actually, I learned from that. <laughs> <laughs> I was sitting there thinking, I don't know what that was. I put some water on the table for you, ladies. It is very hot in this Thank food. you. Yeah. Apologies for those of you who heard the big, several big bangs in the middle of the presentation. That was me closing <laughs> uh, the door and then dropping my laptop. <laughs> So we've got some quite specific questions that have come in, and we've got two in the chat. Um, perhaps I'll pass the first one to Claire Woodley to start off with, and um, but also ask you both Lauren and Rachel to comment. So the first one is about if your blood levels get down to normal through chemo, do you still get symptoms? So. I think the question is, can you still get symptoms even with a normal blood count? So, so I suppose it also depends on kind of what symptoms you're experiencing first, because sometimes we know that we might initiate treatment to help patients to try and improve the symptoms that they are experiencing. Um, and, I'm, and some patients will find that as their blood counts normalize, a lot of their symptoms will improve. Unfortunately, some patients will still experience symptoms irrespective of what their blood counts are doing. So we do still find that some patients will get fatigue, even if they have a very well controlled blood count, um, and they might still experience some other symptoms with a very well controlled blood count. So I think it, it kind of depends on, are we focusing on one particular symptom or are we talking about symptoms in kind of more broadly? Um, and, and certainly we know that even for some patients with very good control of their blood count, they may still experience symptoms. So it is important, again, that if you are getting symptoms, that you do discuss them with your team, um, because it's not always about the blood counts. It, it's about how you are feeling. We might have tip-top blood counts, but actually you're not feeling great with your symptoms despite that. So um, unfortunately, yes, for some patients, they may still experience symptoms, even though they might have a normalised blood count. And some symptoms can come on with drug therapy, of course. It's kind of side effects of drugs. So probably keeping a diary is super important. I was just going to say in terms of, so when people are on active treatment, actually keeping a diary in terms of, because when you're coming into your clinic appointments and things like that, you're getting to know what your blood results are. So actually writing that down on um, the place, maybe where you're keeping your fatigue diary or log, because then it will help you notice whether there's a particular pattern. So then you can plan for those um, events um, in the future. But obviously things can change as well. So it's really important to not just assume that that's going to happen maybe for the next cycle of treatment that you have. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And as we said, sometimes doing the MPN 10 in between those clinics or if you start a treatment, that will tell you and help you track, are these symptoms getting better with this treatment or are some of them changing or are some of them not responding to the treatment? I think, sadly, what we know about fatigue is that it, it is a really, really complex symptom and there are so many variables and compounding factors and things we don't fully understand and it's very individual from from person to person so definitely flagging up 
to, to your treating teams, to your medical teams, to healthcare professionals about fatigue, you know, because we know that it may still be a problem irrelevant of, of blood counts. And also it may not arise until after you finish comp- um, completed your treatment. So actually you may not have um, a fatigue as a symptom throughout your treatment course, but actually it then is noticeable once you've completed treatment. And again, it's still really important that you um, seek advice from medical professionals to actually support you with that. So just because maybe you finish treatment and things like that, that doesn't mean to say that you still can't access those services to, to help manage it once you've completed treatment. Yeah. The other thing is thinking about what time, how does it, how do your symptoms come on related to treatment? So for hydroxyurea or hydroxycarbamide, sometimes we, if you're feeling more fatigued on that drug, sometimes taking it at a different time of day. Um, I'm loving the message from Jackie in the chat about spending time outside in a green space and blue space while swimming. Not always possible in the UK, (laughs) but it is feasible and it certainly seems very attractive. And there's a beautiful picture at the moment on the bottom of our screen that calls it out. And I think there's something very nice about being outside, isn't there as well? So I just wanted to ask a follow-up question. If you're going to keep a diary, what things should be in that diary? And I'm really interested in that because I know that MPN Voice is thinking about building an app that includes a symptom tracker, but it would be great to think about what kind of things you might want to put in there. So we mentioned sort of tablets. Yeah. You mentioned triggers. So I I do quite a lot of work with people uh, with fatigue diaries and I... I guess one of the main things I think about them is that they need not to be really, really time consuming and additionally fatiguing because then I find people won't do them. Um, so I, I prefer a template which is sort of uh, days of the week and hours of the day. And what helps I find the most when I'm sort of looking in a bit more depth with patients at their fatigue is a sort of rough idea hour by hour over the course of a couple of weeks what they're doing activity wise so by that I don't mean you know you don't I don't need a dear diary moment but just got up by eight o'clock you know if you did some work on a computer from 11 to two a bracket computer work so I get a rough idea of hour by hour what what you're doing activity wise in your day Um, and then another thing that's really helpful when we're looking at a bit more in-depth analysis is some some sort of symbols or a key with some signs about things like anything you've noticed that makes your energy worse, a little star or dot by, anything that makes your energy better, a different symbol by, um, anything in particular that you've you've noticed patterns wise, just a little note, um, because that can really help us when we're thinking about strategies and how we might tweak things and adapt things Um, and another really helpful thing is a a level of fatigue um, on on that whether everyone's seen it or not I'm not sure but on the zero to ten scale that you often see zero being no fatigue at all ten being the absolute worst you can possibly imagine what can be really helpful is is a score of that on average each day so not for the end of the day because often we know that things are worse by then but on average for that day where was your energy at on that scale and that really helps us look at what your energy is doing because what we often see is this sort of spiky peaking um, pattern of energy and what we're looking to do is to balance that out a bit more consistently so that score is a really helpful thing for us as well that tends to be my favourite yeah, fatigue think, diary. Do you yeah. think the same? Because sometimes people become then, they give loads of detail, which is great, but actually they find it really fatiguing to do. <laughs> really um, so all we've had patients before that have like colour-coded things. So mm-hmm. to keep it even simpler, so use different highlighters for different things. And also, I guess, um, as we alluded to earlier in terms of noting how they feel once they've had a, a nap or yeah. sleep, I think that's the key thing, because then that gives an indication of the severity of, of the fatigue as well. Mm-hmm. Awesome. I'm coming to you when we're designing this <laughs> diary. <laughs> I like in colour coding because it helps you to see patterns. Exactly. It? Exactly. And, it's, and it just keeps it a bit simpler as well. Yeah. Rather than just lots of the same colour, black ink or blue ink. And it also 
it just you don't have to go too much into the text as mm -hmm. well yeah um there's a question about there's a, quite a few questions about how to overcome fatigue well i really hope we've given you some help with that so i'm, I'm not going to repeat that but there's a question about why do i get so tired after eating for me, I know that's because sometimes I might go and get some naughty stuff to eat <laughs> that gives me a big sugar high and then a massive dip yeah. afterwards. But that was just a common thing. I don't know if anybody, any of you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I do think that to a certain extent, getting a bit tired after having a meal, particularly if it's you know a large meal or a particularly naughty meal, is, is normal to a certain extent. I know that, you know, after lunch, I often fancy a bit of a bit of a nap um but I don't know you know whether that's because it is something that I do hear people say a lot and whether that's something that is worse for people if you've got a fatigue and that then you know you makes that that tiredness feel worse at that time maybe worth including in the diary 100 yeah. yeah. I guess also the advice would be maybe if you are feeling that fatigued after eating is actually just breaking down what you're eating mm. into smaller chunks so actually snacking more rather than having one big meal and yeah. um, so actually just breaking down the amount that you're eating at each meal time yeah so so you can still eat the same amount but just yeah. you're just breaking up a little bit so yeah. because also sometimes we find that patients then get quite breathless as well after they've eaten food and things like that so I don't know if people experience that but that's something that's also quite common but. and I think certainly that's something we suggest with patients that perhaps um, find that they have the early satiety so you know they can't eat their big four meals mm -hmm. so you know for those patients we are suggesting little and often yeah, yeah. Some bit, a little snack yeah. I think you yeah. Yeah. okay here's a great question how do we know fatigue is psychological and or caused by other circumstances and how much is really caused by MPN? And that's really interesting when it comes to also filling out other symptoms on the tracker. I've got bone pain, but I'm not scoring it because I don't think it's down to my MPN. So I'm really interested in your views on that. Who wants it? You're, yeah. You are nodding, Lauren, so you it's go ahead. It's yeah. so hard, isn't it? It's so... It's really complicated and I don't know, annoyingly, I don't know that I, I necessarily have an answer because I think things can be so intrinsically linked with the symptoms and, you know, it's so hard to know what impacts what, what might be causing what, what what's interplaying with what, in what way, to what extent. It's really, it's really difficult sometimes I find to sort of hone in and break down well, i think though that's sometimes part of the assessment that you do because i know sometimes we will assess in fact mm. we, you've done that recently mm. we've sent a patient to you and you've said actually i think this patient's really got rheumatoid arthritis mm. please can you say so i think yeah. that's actually also part of mm. a deep dive assessment into yeah. symptoms isn't it so yeah. There's also a question about bone pain here and how do I know it's part of my pegasus? Well, that's actually about having an assessment, isn't it, I think? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's such a, it's so, you know, I've said this so many times, it's such an individual thing. And that, you know, that's why we do a lot of one-to-one -one in depth assessment because it is so individ individual to each person. It, it needs that real focus and, and picking apart the complexities of it. So I think that's also true of there's a question in the chat about muscle feeling issues on hydroxycarbamide. Could it be a factor? Yes, it could be, yeah. but there could be other factors in yeah. play there as well. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. And again, like peripheral neuropathy on its own is can is managed in, in obviously different ways, obviously to fatigue and things like that. But again, that needs to be as a symptom or as a side effect needs to be um, thoroughly looked at by a health professional in terms of to help manage peripheral neuropathy as a symptom and a side effect. And um, because there's lots that also can be done and trial to help manage that symptom. Yeah. Okie dokie. Okay, that's a great question again from Jackie about hormones and menopause and menstrual cycle and symptoms well I think that's probably something you would pick up but we do often have chats about well do you think you're sweating a bit more and you're a bit tighter and you feel less able to concentrate maybe because you're menopausal yeah I mean Claire do you want to comment on that maybe um, I mean yeah definitely and and that's about exploring your symptoms in 
with with your clinicians and and kind of finding a pattern and is there a change in kind of circumstances for you that when we notice the change in your fatigue levels so you know unfortunately for ladies menopause is part of our journey so you know and that comes with its whole set of a wide range of symptoms that do overlap with some of the MPN symptoms that we experience. So, uh, you know, as we've already said, Stephen, it's about exploring that symptom in depth and, and discussing it with you. I do think we're, we're talking about how women might describe more fatigue. I think sometimes is it also about how we might express or how we might chat. So you know, is it that women might find it easier to discuss their symptoms in, in a clinic than perhaps men might do? And is it that, you know, we're more open to discussing sometimes how we feel with our symptoms? Um, so I think there are lots of things that come into play with how we describe and how we um, discuss symptoms in our clinics. And, and when we see patients, you know, um, because for me, I quite often find patients will walk into the room and the first thing is, how is my blood? Um, for me, it's more about how are you first? And then we'll talk about your blood. Um, so, you know, I, I do think it, it's how we approach discussing symptoms and how patients want to discuss their symptoms as well. Okay, I'm going to come on and just ask, there's a great question that was submitted earlier. I'm sorry, we won't get to all of them, but... What about getting your stamina back after COVID? Comments on that's, that, That's please. a very interesting <laughs> question. So the, the key thing is doing graded. So you need to be kind to yourself if you've had COVID and you're still recovering from it, because it, it can take some time to fully recover from COVID. But the key advice is, is that you do graded approach back to, it depends on what your activity levels or exercise levels were pre you having COVID, but you can't just go straight back in and, and think that you're going to be able to do the same level of exercise or physical activity that you was before. You need to take a graded approach and gradually build back up to actually what you was doing and actually note how you're feeling after you've done maybe some of the um, graded approach um, to actually gauge the um, recovery in terms of then how close are you getting back to like your baseline levels before you actually had COVID. But the key advice is be kind to yourself, have rest and um, do a graded approach post-COVID. And there are some post-COVID clinics there in is. some hospitals. Yeah. Some yeah. Places, yes, with work. Checking and it has physios and OTs in those. Like we certainly have in our um, COVID clinic here, we have physios and OTs that are part of that team as well. Yeah. So. So, but to get into one of those clinics, just to say to folk, one, you need to be a, at least 100 days after COVID. Yeah. So that's, we have this thing called long COVID. Um, the other thing is, you know, just thinking about the symptoms that you have. So do you have a chat to your healthcare team mm. as well? So, and that's probably something that's better in your local hospital yeah. as well, because you need to be traveling. Okie dokie. We've had a couple of comments in the chat about kind of people find it difficult to explain the fatigue. So hopefully some of what you've heard tonight might help you explain it to others, how your fatigue affects you. And certainly, Peter, yes, the heat in London is affecting <laughs> fatigue levels. Um, and so, so I, I will really agree with you on that one. I, I think, think going, sorry, getting good sleep. Go I on. think going back to Ellis's comment around, there is no one way really to explain fatigue to anybody. It's about actually recognising that it is a symptom and it is a recognised symptom. That is very common, but it's often underreported by patients because they don't really see it as, oh, I'm a bit tired or I'm a bit fatigued. If that's kind of normal. It, it's not. And you actually need to seek professional help to actually support you through it so you can get back to doing things that are meaningful for you. Um, and um, even if 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 hearing us today is just validating that fatigue is a symptom um, and but there is help out there is what I kind of wanted to reiterate and even if it's a I can't find a way of explaining you know how it makes me feel because that's really difficult if if you can explain some of the stats and some of the factual information around it that we've talked about today you know even even that sort of explanation you know of it as as a real really genuine thing like Rachel said, you know, can be really, can be really, really powerful for people. And remember that you can go to your clinical team. So we quite often will do supporting documentation yeah. for, for, work, for yeah. patients for work to say about how fatigue can affect patients and how it can impact on all different components. 
that might affect you in your working day mm -hmm. and certainly kind of seeing occupational health at work mm -hmm. to um, put in additional services so it might be an extra 15 minute break or extra breaks yeah, during yeah. the day so please there are plenty of things that we can help with so mm -hmm. do discuss it with your clinical team yeah you're not alone and if you can't get an answer keep trying go to your gp yeah. write down how it's yeah. affecting you so uh, we've only got five minutes left i'm gonna stick to the topic of symptoms actually because we've got the experts in the room here so there's a question here about night sweats and what could night sweats be an indication of well number one is it's hot <laughs> <laughs> number two for me it actually sweating at night is quite common with MPN patients but when we talk about night sweats you need to be really clear what you're talking about so the ones that we worry about are the ones that are really drenching and you need to change your bed clothes or change your t-shirts or whatever but anybody of you ladies want to comment otherwise on night sweats maybe Claire start off yeah so I mean how can you manage them I suppose it's looking at the temperature of your room at night is your room too hot sometimes it's the bed sheets that you're using or the nightwear that you're using so sometimes changing to a different type so cotton sheets might actually um, make it easier for you again there are other things that can be causing night sweat so unfortunately we've had the topic already raised about menopause so for ladies that that can impact on night sweats um sometimes if you're if you have fever or you have infection that can cause night sweats so you know there are other things that need to be explored when somebody has a, a change in in their night sweats but certainly kind of looking at the environment where you're sleeping can actually help with um with night sweats I know certainly at the moment my other half has the fan on constantly but whereas I'm a cold water also for me that's not helping sleep but certainly you know it cools the room down so on that vein basis it helps with kind of night sweats and things from that side of things so there could be other things needs to be thought about mm. could be a medication mm. thing yeah. could be a thyroid thing could be an environment but if it's new I guess that's the thing if it's a new symptom that you're noticing then it is worth seeking professional help to it, kind of like look into it a bit more especially if it is something that you didn't have and then you mm. now have so and kind of bothersome exactly that, yeah. and you need to rule out anything else that might be happening so. okie dokie and there is another question in here about dizziness just try to find it we got lots of great questions for this evening. Thank you, everybody who's been putting comments in the chat and asking questions. What is the best way to deal with dizzy spells and nausea? They are unpredictable and do not follow any pattern, making it difficult to know whether it is the MPN or the medication or something else. So I'll maybe talk about what I think and then pass it over. I think whoever's put that question in, thanks for that. Your thinking pattern, you're thinking, could it be my MPN? It would be unusual to have nausea from an MPN, but you could as a side effect of um, treatment. For example, aspirin can give you indigestion and make you feel sick. Mm. Some of the drugs we give do cause a bit of nausea. So think about that, but don't always assume it's your MPN. So do have a chat to your GP, see mm. what the pattern is. We would be particularly concerned, for example, if the dizziness is impairing you um, being able to walk around. We'd also be concerned if you were nauseous and losing weight or having pain. So those are things that we would be thinking about. And I think that this is something that, again, raise it with your clinical team, go to the key worker, ask the question. And if you don't get an answer, go to your GP. And if they don't give you an answer, ask them to contact your health team. So it's 17.59. I think it's time to leave this hot room <laughs> and let everybody who is um, about to have the opportunity to go and enjoy a little bit less strong sun. I want to leave with saying thanks to everyone. I know Nona's going to hand over, but for those of you who are going out in the sun, please cover up. <laughs> Please wear sunscreen, especially those of you who are on hydroxyurea or a jack inhibitor. 
Thanks very much to everyone. And we will feed back on the questions we haven't answered. Nona, over to you. Thank you. I've got an, an ending slide somewhere. Um, okay. Um, I really want to say a huge thank you to all of you this evening, because I think it's been a really, really informative and helpful session from beginning to end. I mean, those top tips are very useful to any of us who struggle with an MPN and fatigue. Um, I also want to say thank you to Danny Palmer and um, from the Commercial Service Directorate at the Guys and St. Thomas's Trust Foundation Trust um, team. I think, Danny, we couldn't do this without you, and we are very grateful to, to you for everything you do. Um, the, but special mention has to be so, to the, the clinicians who have given up their time so generously uh, to support us. It's really appreciated. Um, and feedback would be incredibly useful to us. Um, if you can feedback, it helps us uh, in planning future, future forums so that we know what the community want to hear and, and want to see. And we really look forward to seeing you all again. I know there's a lot of COVID about in, uh, again, so stay well and keep safe. And finally, if you feel like donating and giving us a little bit of financial support, please check the website for directions on how to do so. And all it remains to say is keep safe and thank you. <laughs>